Good evening. My name is Phyllis Barrington and with me I have my colleague Dr. Melissa Call. And we will be presenting Survivor Sensory Island um, Strategies for Sensory Processing. Before we get started, we want to show you a very quick little clip from the Survivor television series. Um, the reason we chose this is because many of our students, um, especially students that have disabilities and students that may have some sensory issues, um, throughout the day, they may feel like they are struggling to survive. And so we want you to kind of listen to some of the terms and phrases that Jeff Probst um, talks about in this video, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Well, you just made one of the biggest moves in the history of this game. Survivor is the most mentally challenging, physically demanding. All right, we're going to have an evacuation. And strategically complex adventure game on television. I'm just playing out numbers in my head. You probably see me going like this quite a bit. <laughs> the players have evolved the game by pushing the boundaries with risky, game-changing moves. If you were to give up immunity, then I would believe you. Brilliant psychological manipulation. I want to give individual immunity to Natalie. Sorry. Innovative methods for gathering information. I can hide right in that, and I'm within five feet away, sitting in my spy shack. And all-in million-dollar moves at Tribal Council. So this is the other immunity idol I've been hanging on to. I'm giving it to Eddie. The looks on faces. The gameplay has become so unpredictable that getting to the end now demands the willingness to risk it all. The I'm thing. drawing rocks. Guys... Unless somebody's I'm... voting my way, I'm drawing rocks. And reveal. Katie, grab your torch. Head over. Next season, we're... Okay. So just hearing some of the things that was going on, can you see how our students are attempting to go through their day? So the elements of the game consist of they're strangers in isolated locations placed in tribes. And you have to think about how our students are located in the schools, how they're located in the classroom. When they first start school, they're strangers. They learn each other later, but they begin to section off and break up into little smaller groups that become tribes. Provide food, water, fire, and shelter for themselves. Many of our students tend to go through this when they go to lunch on a daily basis. They separate themselves again, but they're providing themselves with that um, element of the game that they have to do daily. Also, there are competition for rewards and immunity from elimination. You see the kids raising their hand. This is something that our ch children have to go through every day, um, raising their hand. That's a competition and possibly elimination because I may not feel comfortable enough to give my answer in the classroom. Um, progressive elimination until a sole survivor remains. This is that competition that happens throughout their educational career. Um, they constantly are in competition. And we're looking for that sole survivor to remain. Everything they do is mentally challenging for those kids that um, are suffering with some type of uh, sensory disorder or sensory processing issue. Sometimes it can be physically demanding, physically demanding on their minds and their bodies for some of our students that have uh, sensory processing issues. It becomes strategically complex for them. They have to think about what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, how. A lot of this happens daily and it becomes, they become anxious. Um, they begin to push the boundaries and this is when you as the parent starts to receive those phone calls because they are pushing the boundaries. The teacher has done everything they can do, and now we need to see what we can do together.
brilliant psychological manipulation. And I love to say all of our kids, all of our little people are the best attorneys because they look for loopholes in everything they do. So that brilliant psychological manipulation happens all the time. Innovative methods for gathering information. They think about ways of um, going around doing the assignment. They, they'll still get it done, but it's an innovative way for them. They may not read the entire book, but they will get um, some type of notes from someone else just to give them a little overview of what it is. We start making those million dollar moves in tribal council. That's when we start going to the principal's office. I made that move, I'm out of the class. Now I'm in, I'm doing this, or I didn't want to sit up front and watch television with the family anyway. You sent me right where I wanted to be, at home, in my room, playing a video game away from you people. Um, and it's always the looks on faces, sometimes, they're going for that look. It's just the looks on the faces. It becomes so because you can't believe it happened and they are just like, yeah, I did it. So what's the big deal about sens the sensory systems? Our sensory system helps keep our bodies and minds at an optimal state of alertness. We want to make sure that we are calm enough to listen and engage, but not so calm that we're falling asleep. We also want to make sure that we are alert enough that we can take the information in and be ready to respond. But we don't want to be so hyperactive and over and just bouncing off the walls. Some of our children have trouble with paying attention and need less sensory input because they are distracted or overwhelmed by certain sensory experiences. And with that being said, we also have those at the other end of the spectrum that need more sensory input. Um, and with how that happens, it's, um, it's important to recognize that there can be too much or too little sensory input. Throughout this training, we will put you in situations to test your sensory limits. We will review each system and provide strategies for students who are seekers and avoiders. And we're going to talk about who are our seekers and who are our avoiders. So sensory processing issues as defined by understood.org, and it is an amazing resource for both teachers and parents not just regarding sensory issues, but academics as well. They say it is difficulties with organizing and responding to information that comes in through the senses. Our kids may be oversensitive to sensory input or undersensitive or both. It can have a big impact on their learning. And we'll, we, we've seen that. This QR code right here um, gives you a sensory processing fact sheet. So if you'd like to, you can just hold your phone up to the QR code and review it later. Um, and it will give you just a little bit of facts, just a, a few facts about sensory processing. So some of the terminology, what I want you to do, I want you to look at this picture and kind of tell me what do you think is happening in each of these photos okay so it's called sensory integration and you'll notice that the first thing we probably do when we see a plane flying above head is that we look up so that's the ability to take in information and process the environment then process organize and synthesize we we heard the plane the next thing we did was look up to see where it was our next terminology term that we're going to give you, if you look at this little fellow, he looks very distressed. It's called sensory integration dysfunction. And he seems to be very upset. And some of our kids go through this. Um, the brain's inability to effectively organize and process stimuli in a way that provides a person with accurate information about his environment. He's probably taking a test or he's doing some type of assignment and he is overwhelmed. He's just not getting it. This little baby here, it's called processing. 
She looks like she's about three years old. We've been putting on kids' shoes forever, and we'll say we're getting ready to go to the store. She runs and go gets her shoes. She's processing. This is her ability to sy systematize and organize the information based on what she's seen in the past, us helping her put her shoe on. she They may not be on the right foot, but she's putting them on because she's seen that happen. This is praxis, the ability to plan, organize, and sequence actions. We see a ball coming at us. The first thing we know to do is how far out should we put our hands to catch the ball? So we are planning, we looking at the ball, we planning, we organizing our thoughts and we know to go forward and um, get the ball. Sensory regulation is a person's ability to respond, to respond just right to the sensory experiences in the environment. Um, you'll see that apparently this, there's an odor and he is just responding the way he feels he wants to respond. But most of us would probably just kind of hold our nose or maybe walk away from that scent. He is holding his nose and that's how, it, that's how he's um, dealing with it. This is a sensory seeker, reminds me of myself. Um, this person desires to expose themselves to a specific form of sensory input. She is smelling this candle. She's probably, um, it's probably some kind of um, nice scent that she likes and she's attracted to it. So this is a seeker. She's seeking that scent. <clears throat> This is sensory arousal. It goes from one extreme to the other. Um, situations require different levels of how alert and how aware they should be. Watching a movie requires less alertness while playing Frisbee with friends would require more. And you'll see one is over is overexerting, um, just jumping on the bed and the other one looks like she hasn't slept all night and she's in school with her head down. Um, the next picture we have is emotional regulation. This picture, you see this baby blowing up a balloon and the anxiety in me of waiting for it to bust. That's my, and, and I have to be able to regulate how I'm going to react when it does. Um, in order to function in our daily lives, we must be able to experience feelings yet manage them. It's like this balloon. We don't want to have not enough air, and but we don't want it to be flat. And you don't want to have too much airway in a pot. We just want to have just enough. Okay. So here, you may know some students or children just like this, where they may be experiencing some sensory issues like I hate having my hair washed, brushed, or cut. I'm just gonna read a few of them. Um, I complain about tags in my clothing. You may see children that always walk on their tiptoes. Sometimes they put their socks on just so, or maybe I never go barefoot. That little line that's in front of the sock, it has to be just right or they can't wear it. They have to keep playing with it until they get it just right or I'm overly sensitive to loud sounds such as vacuums and blenders and we see this with our students that struggle with sensory um, issues. So let's take a virtual tour of, a, of someone who um, is experiencing sensory input, different types of sensory input. And I'd like for you, while you were doing that, to possibly write down how many ways you see the input happening. What's What could be do, um, doing some harm to this person, this uh, child that's in this video? Just wait there one minute, I'm just gonna get a ticket, okay?
Okay, so could you see how all of these different things that were happening in the mall, the, the wasting of her drink, mom constantly saying, calm down, calm down, could be very distracting. Um, the alarm going off, the Mylar balloons, people walking by staring because they're probably looking at me because I'm already anxious. So those are some of the things that those sensory issues are occurring for that for that person, that that child that's there. So our first area of sensory that we're going to discuss is proprioception. And it's from from Latin propius, meaning one's own or individual and copio or copri to take or grasp in a sense of the relative position of neighboring parts. So that means we're looking at it from your body and where it is in space. OK. What we're going to do now is watch a video on what proprioception looks like. You know how we keep checking our mouth when it's numb after a dentist visit? Well, if we can't feel a body part, it can totally distract us. And that's what happens when our proprioceptive system isn't up to speed. This important sensory system has receptors in our muscles, ligaments, and joints that are supposed to tell us where our body parts are and what they're doing without looking at them. However, if this sensory system isn't fully awake, we gotta do something to help it out. Like tap our foot, if we're not sure where it is at the moment. So as long as we're tapping, we're good. But it's usually not too long before we hear... Katie, stop that tapping! Yet, as soon as we stop, we don't know where our foot is again. So we're back to thinking about that instead of focusing on what we're doing. When the proprioceptive system isn't doing its job, we like to chew on just about everything. Especially when we have to sit still or we're stressed about something. And it seems crazy, but it's like all the chairs in the world are slippery. But just to us, here's what often happens. To pay better attention to a lesson, we begin rocking. With the rocking, we're now totally getting what the teachers say. But all that movement may then cause us to start to fall off the chair. If our proprioceptive system does its job, it sends a quick message to our brain to make an adjustment, which then keeps us on the seat. However, if we don't get that message in time, then before you know it, we slide right off the chair and onto the floor. When that happens, some of us are embarrassed, or some of us pretend that we fell on purpose to save some face. But the truth is, none of us know why we keep ending up on the floor. To make matters worse, we then get in trouble if others thought we were goofing around and not listening. Sad thing is, we actually fell because we were paying attention. The proprioceptive system also tells us how much pressure we need to do something. But if we're not getting that message, it can mess us up in a lot of ways. Without the right feedback, we might hold the pencil too tightly. Or not tight enough. Or we might erase so hard the paper rips. And people think we're not kind when we pet the dog too hard or play too roughly with other kids. And if that weren't enough, people get annoyed when we touch everything we pass. But they'd do the same if they were blind or it was dark and they had to walk straight ahead. That's because touching the wall gives us a reference point. This is me. This is a wall. It's just that some of us need that reference point even when the lights are on. And there's more. 
With poor proprioception, we often invade everyone else's space. The problem is, we don't realize that we're in their space. Unfortunately, people often get annoyed with kids who lean, tap, chew, and touch things all the time. So it's good to know that it doesn't have to be that way. Not at all. We can totally wake up and improve our proprioceptive system. And while we're at it, we can have a whole lot of fun. Okay, that's just an overview of what proprioception is. Um, some students are hypersensitive, meaning they get too much input, and we will call them avoiders. Some students are hyposensitive, meaning that they don't get enough input, and we will call them seekers. These are just some of the characteristics above that may be a sign of some sensory needs that are that your children may may have. This is not an exhaustive list and each child may manifest differently. So some of our avoiders, they may appear lazy or lethargic. Sometimes they avoid high intensity activities. They prefer to sit still or avoid touch from others, seems uncoordinated, looks to do unfamiliar activities and difficulty using stairs. And these are our avoiders. With our seekers, they run into objects or walls, use extreme force, they stomp or walk loudly, poor body awareness, they kick, bite, or hit, they have poor personal space, prefers tight clothing, and chews on their clothing, pencils, fingers, probably eating fingernails, those types of things. So what can we do? Um, think of activities which will work with the muscles and joints, something like weight bearing activities, resistance like pushing and pulling, heavy lifting, um, cardiovascular activities like taking them outside, running, jumping, get some of that energy out of them, and oral activities like blowing bubbles, chewing, Gum, I know we don't let them do it in school, but chewing gum does help. At home, when they feel wiggly, they can crawl through a tunnel, make, make um, do the wall push-ups, um, put books on a shelf, blowing the bubbles, have them go outside and help uh, do the, the lawn, the, the work for the lawn, like pushing a lawnmower, maybe um, when it gets summertime, we get ready to seed the garden or what have you. Have a beanbag chair for the beanbag chair sandwich. Um, play steamroller. That, that's something that they like. And take them in the kitchen. If you are a cook, roll out the Play-Doh or roll out the dough. Have them roll the dough for you. Okay. So the tactile is activating of nerve signals beneath the skin surface, which is touch, that inform the body of texture, temperature, and other touch senses, sensations. So we've talked about what tactile is. Let's talk about who our avoiders and seekers are. Those kids that avoid those, that touching avoid certain textures or clothing, um, even as adults, some of us avoid certain textures. I do not like those little uh, beads, those little squishy beads. I can't stand them. I don't like to. I don't even like to look at them, but I can't stand to touch them. Avoids or dislike messy play. I would be that child because I do not like finger painting. Distressed by certain clothing, such as pants, seams, and socks, and new textures. Extremely ticklish dislike getting their hands and face washed. Sometimes they can be picky eaters because it's just the textures of certain foods. When it comes to our seekers, they seem dirty or messy. They're not aware of being touched by others. They have a high pain tolerance. They can be hurtful to other children by hitting and punching. 
They prefer tight clothing. They crave strong flavors. They may like that garlic. They may like the that spicy food. And they keep mouth um, objects in their mouth. So what can we do? Um, as parents, we encourage children to explore their tactile input. So it's important to follow many of the suggestions that we are providing here. Um, we never want to force a child to experience something or sensory input that is uncomfortable for them. We want to make sure that we are building their trust and encourage by providing input in small doses. So we want to make sure that we're giving them those things um, to help them understand their tactile sensory. Um, begin with dry textures, watching to see what that child accepts and tolerates. And then we'll just move on to different varieties of those dry textures, like beans or a ball. Then we'll move on to maybe like some um, shaving cream, those types of things so that they can feel it and understand what it, what it feels like and not be afraid of it. So more strategies, learn to play with their hands on manipulatives. Um, many um, primary toys do provide a lot of the, the hands-on manipulatives. Um, avoid using pencil and paper. Sometimes we have to adapt worksheets to make them more interactive. Using that cut and paste for them, those types of activities at home would be good for them. Incorporate textures such as Velcro, the puffy paint, um, sandpaper. It gives them a different texture, a different feel. The shaving cream, it provides that tactile feedback. Um, providing tactile breaks to encourage deep pressure if needed, things like a weighted pillow, um, bear hugs. I, I just recently bought a weighted blanket from Amazon because it helps me sleep better, but I like that feel of a weighted blanket. Okay. Use more blankets at night. Extra weight provides the deep pressure. Um, if they are sensitive to touch and avoid hugs, do not take it personally. Find other ways to show them that you love them. Um, high fives are great. Fist bumps, pinky promises, that's always great for our kids. And help them set boundaries with other people so that people understand that it's nothing personal. It's just the way they're, they're um, built. So our olfactory. This is this this right here is our sensory receptors are in the nose and they pick up information about odors around us. And they pass that information along those nerve channels where it eventually reaches the brain and the the brain determines whether or not they like it. If it's a good smell, something that is dangerous, pleasurable or foul. <clears throat> It's the first sense you use when you're born. One out of every 50 of your genes is dedicated to it. It must be important, right? Okay, take a deep breath through your nose. It's your sense of smell, and it's breathtakingly powerful. As an adult, you can distinguish about 10,000 different smells. Here's how your nose does it. Smell starts when you sniff molecules from the air into your nostrils. 95% of your nasal cavity is used just to filter that air before it hits your lungs. But at the very back of your nose is a region called the olfactory epithelium, a little patch of skin that's key to everything you smell. The olfactory epithelium has a layer of olfactory receptor cells, special neurons that sense smells, like the taste buds of your nose. When odor molecules hit the back of your nose, they get stuck in a layer of mucus covering the olfactory epithelium. As they dissolve, they bind to the olfactory receptor cells, which fire and send signals through the olfactory tract up to your brain. As a side note, you can tell a lot about how good an animal's sense of smell is by the size of its olfactory epithelium. A dog's olfactory epithelium is 20 times bigger than your puny human one. But there's still a lot we don't know about this little patch of cells, too. For example, our olfactory epithelium is pigmented, and scientists don't really know why. But how do you actually tell the difference between smells? It turns out that your brain has 40 million different olfactory receptor neurons. So odor A might trigger neurons 3, 427, and 988. And odor B might trigger neurons 8, 
76 and 2,496,678. All of these different combinations let you detect a staggeringly broad array of smells. Plus, your olfactory neurons are always fresh and ready for action. They're the only neuron in the body that gets replaced regularly, every four to eight weeks. Once those neurons are triggered, the signal travels through a bundle called the olfactory tract to destinations all over your brain, making stops in the amygdala, the thalamus, and the neocortex. This is different from how sight and sound are processed. Each of those signals goes first to a relay center in the middle of the cerebral hemisphere, and then out to other regions of the brain. But smell, because it evolved before most of your other senses, takes a direct route to these different regions of the brain, where it can trigger your fight or flight response, help you recall memories, or make your mouth water. But even though we've all got the same physiological setup, two nostrils and millions of olfactory neurons, not everybody smells the same things. One of the most famous examples of this is the ability to smell so-called asparagus pee. For about a quarter of the population, urinating after eating asparagus means smelling a distinct odor. The other 75% of us don't notice. And this isn't the only case of smells differing from nose to nose. For some people, the chemical androstenone smells like vanilla. To others, it smells like sweaty urine which is unfortunate because androstenone is commonly found in tasty things like pork. So with the sweaty urine smellers in mind, pork producers will castrate male pigs to stop them from making androstenone. The inability to smell a scent is called anosmia, and there are about 100 known examples. People with illicit anosmia can't smell garlic. Those with eugenol anosmia can't smell cloves. And some people can't smell anything at all. This kind of full anosmia can have several causes. Some people are born without a sense of smell. Others lose it after an accident or during an illness. If the olfactory epithelium gets swollen or infected, it can hamper your sense of smell, something you might have experienced when you were sick. And not being able to smell anything can mess with your other senses, too. Many people who can't smell at all also can't really taste the same way the rest of us do. It turns out that how something tastes is closely related to how it smells. As you chew your food, air is pushed up your nasal passage, carrying with it the smell of your food. Those scents hit your olfactory epithelium and tell your brain a lot about what you're eating. Without the ability to smell, you lose the ability to taste anything more complicated than the five tastes your taste buds can detect. Sweet, salty, bitter, sour, and savory. So the next time you smell exhaust fumes, salty sea air, or roast chicken, you'll know exactly how you've done it. And perhaps be a little more thankful that you can. Okay, so our students or our children that are avoiders, they avoid particular smells. They become agitated or frustrated around certain smells, or they could gag certain smells of food. Foods don't taste appealing, um, tells others they stink, avoids public places, does not like being hugged or close to people because everyone has a different scent on them and avoids unfamiliar foods due to smells. With our seekers, they like to smell objects. You ever seen someone who smells their food before they eat it? That's my daughter. She smells all of her food before she eats it. Um, enjoys strong scents, prefer foods with strong smells, doesn't notice dangerous smells, prone to eating or drinking dangerous items. Um, trouble identifying foods by smell and smells, objects, and or people constantly. So what can we do about it? Um, suggestions for exploring the sense of smell. When it comes to stronger smells, try to um, have something like peppermint or lemon. They're typically associated with more, to, um, with more alert behavior. Those softer smells like lavender and rose are typically associated with calmer behaviors. Make your own scratch and sniff stickers and or Kool-Aid Play-Doh. Um, cooking with kids is a great way to experiment with different smells. And I just know I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people that definitely I'm constantly in Bath and Body Works. So I do understand those senses and those smells that they just come at you. The lavender is really calming for real. Um, at home, you can do this tea bag matching game. You can do the lotion or Kool-Aid Play-Doh. So you get the Play-Doh and mix it with a flavored pack of Kool-Aid along with this recipe. And that will help your child with their olfactory senses. Our next sense sensory system that we want to talk about is our auditory. 
And these are our students who are over responsive to auditory input. They can't filter out background and competing noises. They tend to be aware of all the noises inside and outside of the classroom. They're constantly looking around because they hear everything, causing them to be highly distracted. So I'm going to ask you to do an activity for me. You see this, see these words here. Um, put each word in alphabetical order. Put each word in alphabetical order. OK, so what you're doing is putting each word in alphabetical order. But I think think about one of our students that has an auditory processing um, issue. I said put each word in alphabetical order. That child would have possibly put each word beginning with snow in alphabetical order. They would have started out with the N O and they would have done that. They would have done, they would have put it in order like that. So that's one of the ways that that auditory processing disorder can happen for our students. So those students that have this are those those avoiders when it comes to their auditory processing, they tend to cry, scream, or become angry at sudden noises. I've seen this happen with many of our students, and I don't know if you've experienced it with your child. Some of them have strong emotions when noise volumes increase. They cover their ears or hide in social situations, avoid everyday noises such as toilet flushing or water flowing, they're bothered by high-pitched noises, whistles, chalk, um, and violins, just music or anything that could be loud to them. They're distressed by metallic sounds such as silverware clinking. It really gets on their nerves and they are avoiders. When it comes to those seekers, they prefer loud music. They seem, seem to always use an outside voice. They talk loud all the time, even on, they, you say use an inside voice and they're constantly sounding like they're on the outside. Puts musical instruments right next to their ears, makes loud noises in quiet settings, enjoyed loud, enjoys loud noises, crave common noises like their air conditioner or fan. Um, seems to be calmed by noises or music. OK. So what can we do for our students that or our kids that are um, experiencing uh, the, the disorder? We try to control the noise level in the classroom. We try to do that. I've seen where parents have gotten the the headphones so that when the child is out in public, it reduces the background noise if it helps with them um, not being so distracted or agitated. Sometimes closing windows and doors to reduce distracting noises and using visual aids to help that child process lessons. Use the headphones to muffle the noise to help. That's helpful. Um, always provide explicit instructions and give examples when you're um, showing a child how to use anything that you would help them to um, with their auditory sensory issues. So sometimes try these listening games. Simon says is great. Um, go fish, red light, green light. These are just some of the things that we could use with our students and they don't get enough games anyway. So let's play some games with our kids and um, see how this works with them. Because I know these things do help with our students. So I want you to listen to each sound and list the items as a group. Um, you can just type them in the chat pod there. Are, <clears throat> and then it's only we're only going to do 10 sounds. And we'll see how how right you are.
So how do you think you did? I was looking at some of your um, answers. And some of you are pretty much on point with number one being a growling dog. Someone said walking for number two, and it was walking on gravel. Three was a, it was a camera. It was an old style camera. Someone said stirring a cup of, they just said stirring, but it was stirring a cup of tea for number four. Pouring water from a bottle. I heard, I saw what someone did that one. Number six was hard to gather. Um, it was rattling paint brushes in a tin. Number seven was pouring water in a toilet. Um, number eight was an alarm clock. Number nine was walking in snow. And 10 was putting coins in a vending machine. So how did you feel about uh, your auditory sensory system at this point? How do you feel? How do you think it worked for you? I think you need to work on it a little bit. So at home, you want to keep, <laughs> it's okay, Christina, <laughs> it's, it's, it's well. At home, keep ear protection close by. Allow the use of headphones or earbuds. When kids are sensitive to noise, the adults in their lives should work together to address safety concerns. Sound sensitivity makes it hard to filter out unimportant sounds, but it can also make it hard to tune into important ones like sirens, alarms, or other safety things, other uh, safety warnings. Help them learn how to set boundaries for themselves and others. If noise from video games are a concern, help them articulate that in a healthy way and not just go and hit the game or tell some scream at someone to tell them to stop, turn it down. So our next session, we will finish up with the other sensory systems. We'll do kind of a wrap up and then we'll take a look at our own um, preferences. So each one of us are seekers and avoiders and uh, for, for different areas. And so we're going to talk about those. All the strategies that we gave you, like listening to the sounds, is a really good strategy for students who have some auditory issues, maybe if they're not very good listeners, or maybe if they're not good with picking out different types of sounds or distinguishing sounds. They have YouTube videos um, that have different sounds for the kids to guess um, in a lot of different age groups. So you could do, you know, adults, or you could do little sounds for little kids, but there are lots of different sounds. Um, games are really, really good for um, listening skills. So, um, you know, our, our, we used to play a lot of games when we were little kids, but um, our kids have gotten away from those games. So if your kids have some difficulties with executive functioning skills like self-management of behavior or being impulsive, or maybe they're not able to be flexible in their thinking, or, um, you know, they're not very good listeners, Playing games, um, the research has shown over and over that playing games is uh, highly recommended for developing those skills. I think even as adults, we all have issues where we might seek out strong scents or seek out spicy foods, but then we avoid certain types of clothing. Or maybe we like going on roller coasters, but we don't like walking on the beach with bare feet, right? So I think it's totally normal. Um, for all of us to be seekers and avoiders. What, what starts um, to become, when it becomes a problem is when it interferes with their daily living or it interferes with their learning. So if I have a tag in the back of my shirt that is scratching me and that's all I can think about is that tag, I'm not going to be able to attend to the directions that are giving in given in class, or I'm not going to be able to complete an assignment. If there's a light flickering um, on the TV or a light flickering um, in the bedroom or the bathroom, and I'm trying to, my, my mom is giving me directions to take a shower or get ready for school or do this or do that, and all I can do is look at that flickering light then it becomes a problem, right? So we all have preferences that we just have learned to kind of adjust to and cope with. It's when those things be, become a, um, a factor and 
that they need to be addressed. So we look forward to seeing all of you back again for the final session.